What are five interesting or obscure facts about Sister by Sonic Youth? Well, today I am digging into Sonic Youth guitarist Thurston Moore's memoir, Sonic Life, and pulling out a few things I learned about the album. I'll answer questions like, how does Elvis Presley factor into the album's title? Why does the album art have a few big black boxes on it? And how does religion play into Sister. Hey fellow music nerds, it is Andy with the Fence Post Vinyl Channel. If you like this sort of content, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, then ring that little bell so you'll be notified when new videos go live. That said, always subject to change, new fun facts about albums you love videos go up every Sunday. Released in the latter half of October of 2023, Sonic Life is a compelling and lengthy memoir from the influential experimental guitarist from the band Sonic Youth, Thurston Moore. He recounts his life growing up in a small town before venturing into the New York City nightlife during the explosion of punk rock during the mid to late 1970s. Then he dives into the formation and tenure of Sonic Youth, including the various early live gigs, tours, and releases the band has given us over the past 40 plus years. It's a long one, I'm still making my way through it, and Sister is chapter 53. But it's a good read, or if you're like me, it's a great audiobook listen narrated by Moore's effortlessly cool, dry, sarcastic drawl. Rather than go into the band's career as a whole, I'm gonna hone in on the album that made me a true fan. It's their pre-teenage daydream release, Sister, from 1987, and here are five fascinating things I learned about the album from Moore's memoir. Number one, the album name. There were a few early working titles of the album, including Kitty Magic, Humpy Pumpy, and Soul F there's also Heather Spinning, which he mentions in the memoir, but is not something that they note yet on Wikipedia. None of these really resonate with me personally, so I'm glad they went with Sister. And there's a story behind that. First, it's a tribute to German visual artist Gerhard Richter and his 1977 painting titled Betty of his then 10-year-old, or maybe 11-year-old daughter. Next, it's a reference to science fiction mastermind and author Philip K. Dick's fraternal twin who died within a few weeks of her birth. The mythos around his sister would kind of emanate throughout Dick's writing into all corners, and paired with the writer's cyberpunk plot lines, it seemed to fit what Sonic Youth was creating in the mid-80s. Finally, the dead twin theme ran rampant in these circles, with both Lydia Lunch and Nick Cave, both of whom spent a fair share of time with members of Sonic Youth in the mid-80s, claimed to have been born alongside one. Moore notes that these claims also gave nod to perhaps the most famous only surviving twin, Elvis Presley. That's something I didn't know. Similarly, Sister was the original title for opening track, Schizophrenia, and it was this song that initially hooked me on the band. 2. Warped Christian Ideology Moore relates the lyrics found within Sister to be inspired by Philip K. Dick's more religious themes, but exploring his own take on Christian ideology, though these references are relatively subtle and layered in obscurity. This is due to him not wanting to kind of project those thoughts and feelings onto the other band members who might feel differently. Perhaps at its most blatant, the religiously thematic elements can be found in songs like I've Got a Catholic Book, White Cross, and maybe even, to a hint, Cotton Crown. Number three, Fringe Entertainment. Even as far back as the mid to late 1980s, there was a move away from analog recording. One studio that kind of eschewed this was Sear Sound in Midtown New York, run by Walter Sear and Roberta Findlay out of the Paramount Hotel. Sear Sound exclusively used audio tube equipment that emphasized a warm vintage sound. It was here that Sonic Youth recorded Sister to 16 track. Both Sear and Findlay had their fingers in entertainment, though certainly not the mainstream. Sear had strong ties to Robert Moog, eventually becoming Moog's business partner and sales agent for Moog's theremin. 
According to Moore, it is Sear who could be credited to convincing Moog to add a keyboard to the original giant synthesizer, thus leading to the portable synthesizer that would soon come thereafter. Finplay 2 also worked in fringe films, and yes, that includes a stint doing some low-budget adult ones. In production around the time Sonic Youth was recording its sister was Finplay's 1987 album Blood Sister. The plot? Seven girls must spend the night in an old house, which was once a brothel, as part of an initiation. Through its tenure, Sear Sound worked with some other well-known artists, including David Bowie, Steely Dan, Paul McCartney, Patti Smith, and Wynton Marsalis, to name a few. They even recorded one or two future Sonic Youth records as well. Number four, No No Wave. Sonic Youth's tenure as a band began out of the no wave scene in the late 70s and very early 80s. But Sonic Youth is a band that has always seen a bit of continual evolution as well. On Sister, the band moved further back from no wave and more into rock sensibilities, if you can call it that, with more solidified song structures and formats, and that led them further away from the no wave origins you can hear on their earlier works. I mean, yesterday I was on a nice lengthy 32 mile bike ride, and I listened to Sister, and then I backed it up and listened to Evil, and you can really see a lot of those differences come to fruition right here on this album. Still, Sister maintained a fair share of experimentation, exploration, and for sure, improvisation. These changes would continue in their time supporting the album, then pull in influence from the burgeoning hip hop scene using samples and sounds employed by artists like the Beastie Boys, Run DMC, and Public Enemy. Probably didn't see that one coming, did you? While these don't show up on Sister, they are a further example of a band that doesn't really get comfortable with any specific sound, always willing to push the boundaries of what's capable in their instrument and with music in general. Pulling in traces of minimalism, the band's origins from no wave, German drone rock, and electronic noise music, they would go on to create and record, leaning heavily into improvisation, what is probably their most heralded album released just 15 months after Sister. That being Daydream Nation. Number five. I've been excited about this one because I actually include some other stuff that's not from the memoir, at least not yet, twice censored. The cover art on Sister, including the front and back of the record jacket, included a hodgepodge of pieces, one part collage, another part kind of mixed media. There are a few items in the artwork that copywriters had an issue with. The band pieced together artwork using postcards picked up while touring, among other things. For example, that toddler on the back sleeve is actually Lee Ronaldo's son. Moore laid out the piece on an LP-sized area, and you can see a cross in the dead space on both sides of the sleeve. Though, flip it over and the cross is inverted. First is the Disney image, rotated 90 degrees clockwise with kind of a Fibonacci sequence type spiral illustrated over it with a black permanent marker. The second is a photograph by Richard Avedon of a young girl atop which the designer put a colorful array of splotches. Visible on the original pressing, like mine, the band and their label, SST, was forced to censor them in future pressings. That's why when you typically see Sister, there is a giant black box on the front and the back. One for Disney, one for Avedon. And about Avedon, he was a well-known photographer who worked for Harper's Bazaar, Elle, Vogue, capturing fashion and beauty and American culture. The photo you see on uncensored versions of Sister was the cover image of his book in the American West, released just two years prior to Sister. Much of what you find within that book stems from a 1979 commission Avedon received from the Eamon Carter Museum in Fort Worth a project titled Western Project. Not knowing the history of Sister's censored artwork, by happenstance, I visited Eamon Carter Museum in Fort Worth back in about August, and I snapped this picture right here. This photo just struck me for its power, the, the raw, the 
unfiltered, the emotion, the hardship. Little did I know it was actually Avedon's photograph titled Homer Emmons, Coal Miner, Somerset, Colorado, 82880. Before leaving the album artwork, I'll point out one more thing. Sonic Youth is typically depicted as this, two standalone words, but here one side is scripted Sonic Dash Youth. Flip it over and Moore wrote the Sonic Youth. While the former was used on their 1983 album Confusion is Sex, the latter hasn't really been used anywhere else, at least that I've been able to find. I could be wrong on that one, so if you are familiar with one where they list themselves as the Sonic Youth, let us know in the comments below. And here's my viewer question for you today. Where does Sister fall for you when it comes to your favorite albums of Sonic Youth? For me as a whole, I prefer it over Daydream Nation from 1988. Oddly enough, right up there with both of those is Rather Ripped from 2006. What album would you like to see me do a five fun facts video about? Let me know down in the comments and if I have it in my collection, maybe there's a chance I'll pull it out and record something here in the near future. And next, check out this video right here where I dig into Pixie's phenomenal album, Doolittle. And this one down here where I actually look at the 1986 album, Walls Have Ears. That is a cool one for sure. I am Andy, this is the Fence Post Vinyl Channel, and I'll see you in the next video.